Thank you for having me at this very exciting workshop of transformative neuroimaging. And I was given this title to talk about the kind of information that can be obtained at very high spatial resolutions. And as you know, the brain initiative has the aim to understand how the brain works and how neural information processing is done across the cortical circuits to ultimately inform human neuroscience. And until now, a very successful viewpoint to understand the brain with non-invasive brain imaging methods is to look at the brain at a spatial scale of all these different brain areas that have their unique abilities. Like, for example, the visual cortex is used for um, visual perception or the sensory motor cortex is used for moving the body. There's auditory cortex and so on and so forth. And for functional MRI methods developer like myself, it's really quite exciting to help advancing the tools to non-invasively capture brain activity changes of these large areas in real time. However, as exciting as it is to see the brain in action like that, it's not really telling us so much about how the brain works, right? It's somewhat comparable as trying to understand how the engine of a truck works by looking at the truck with an infrared camera you roughly know which parts seem to be involved, like that the front is heating up and seems to consume a lot of energy, but we are not really having a deterministic view of the underlying processes. So to get there, we need imaging tools across spatial scales to also see the smallest elements of the circuitry here. Namely, within gray matter, in the submillimeter regimes, we are, are starting to approach the level of the mechanics of the smallest neural building blocks, the cortical layers. And these neural layers have different neurons that do very different things and follow predefined unique information processing algorithms. And conventional non-invasive neuroimaging needs to kind of lump all these different uh, cell populations into the same big pixels or voxels. Only high resolution layer specific imaging has the promise to resolve those different processes. And since these layers have very different functional connections, any kind of high resolution information that we might be able to give the neuroscientists will tell them not only if an area is involved in a certain task, but also what its content is, like where this activity comes from, how it's following the different processing steps, how it's modulated and ultimately sent to other areas for further processing with respect to feedback and so on and so forth. Thus, with the right neuroimaging high-resolution tools, neuroscientists will know which areas are connected to each other, which of those connections are functionally stronger than others, and most importantly, they will know something about directionality, causality of these connections. And until now, like previous proof of principal studies of layer-dependent fMRI could indeed show just that, namely directional connectivity, something that was until then only possible in the realm of invasive preclinical research. So at conventional resolutions, when you ask a person to move their hand, you get this kind of heat map like activation in the sensory motor system, as you can see here, which is really cool, but it doesn't really tell us what the brain is becoming activated for. So for example, when you ask a person to use their imagination and just think about moving their hand, the same brain areas are becoming activated. And the researcher didn't really learn a lot. Like it might be completely puzzling why we have this identical brain pattern that results in so different behavior. So when you focus all your efforts onto this tiny part of the brain here, not even capturing 1% of the cortex, it is possible to increase the resolution further and further and further until you start to see these stripy patterns of the network logistics referring to the different cortical layers. So here, these pixels forming a line refer to neurons that receive a lot of cortico-cortical motor planning input, whereas these pixels here forming a line refer to neurons that send output to the spinal cords to ultimately trigger the muscles to move. And with this high resolution, we can now finally see how this is not the case for this imaginary tapping, where we don't have this secondary output stripe only the input because the muscles are not being engaged. So giving neuroscientists tools to see these kind of stripy patterns will be very valuable to tell them not only if there's activity or not, but also um, to resolve the individual processing computational stages involved. Or at least that's the hope of layer fMRI. To get there, however, there are several technical challenges that need to be overcome, which I was also asked to talk about. And I guess from the methodological point of view, one of the biggest challenges still is 
the detection sensitivity. And you might know that um, here shown on this back of the envelope estimation that in MRI, the signal strength is directly proportional to the amount of magnetization we have available in the sample, namely the voxel. So going from a conventional three millimeter or two millimeter fMRI voxel to the upper limit of layer fMRI voxel in the range of 0.75 millimeters is a huge reduction in volume. It's a factor of 64. So there is no question that we need to make compromises if we only have one over 64th the, the kind of signal. We cannot simply go to 50 Tesla scan scanners or average 4,000 times as long. The second big challenge is the localization specificity that even with these small voxels, conventional neuroimaging contrasts still don't really allow us to see these stripy patterns. In fact, when you just go to these high resolutions, you still end up with these fuzzy blobs. And now you just have this blob at high resolution, but it's still a fuzzy blob. And the reason for this is that these conventional gradient echo bold neuroimaging methods are mostly sensitive to oxygenation changes in the large draining veins, which are not as nicely lamina aligned like the neurons are. And this is in fact well known and the entire research field has been looking for technologies to mitigate these large vein contaminations since a few decades. And there are a few methods out there. And my personal favorite is to mitigate these large vein effects during the data acquisition by using alternative contrasts that are more sensitive to blood volume changes of the small vessels that are closely aligned to the laminar neural structures, finally allowing us to see these stripy patterns, even though it comes along with a higher noise level too. And with this blood volume method out there, it didn't take very long to until people also applied this in the more cognitive domain of the associative cortex. And this here is an example of one of the upcoming speakers in this very session, Emily Finn, looking at the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, where we know approximately from um, animal electrophysiology that there are these different cell populations, like for example, the so-called Q cells or delay cells or response cells that ultimately trigger the motor system, which are all located across different cortical lamina. So Emily used this specific task to engage these different circuits differently by showing participants these strings of letters and then cueing them to either memorize these letters in the order they saw them, or to sort these letters mentally according to an alphabetical order in their mind, which is believed to exclusively engage the superficial circuits here. Later in the trials, the participants are asked to do a response decision, um, which then is expected to exclusively engage the deeper output layers. And this kind of simplified microcircuitry then nicely explains the kind of signal changes you're getting across cortical depths in this uh, tiny part of the brain here in the DLPFC, namely showing that for the output activity, we see activity exclusively in the deeper layers following the cortical ribbon and kind of parallel to that for the alphabetization, there's activity in the superficial layers, maybe even better visible in the time courses here of the group results where you can see that the working memory layers, the superficial ones, they really shoot up in activity as soon as the participants start with this alphabetization and it goes back to baseline when they found a solution. And this is very different for the deeper output layers, which kind of don't care about this alphabetization. They basically stay at baseline and only shoot up as soon as the participant knows the right position and presses the button. So also for this high resolution study, the imaging technology was really focusing on this part of the brain, which is kind of ironic that these layer fMRI methods allow to address these fundamentally new questions about directional connectivity, like whether it's output or not, but they don't really tell us where the output is going to, like where the output is arriving. So it's funny to have a connectivity technology that doesn't really allow us to see connections between areas. So there was a lot of effort in many research groups over the last few years to increase the coverage of these imaging methods from something like this, barely covering the DLPFC to something like an entire slice. And in fact, many, 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 many of them to literally cover everything, the entire brain. And in this example, such coverage improvements of like two orders of magnitude were made possible by taking advantage of signal redundancies in the multiple radio frequency antennas of the common MRI hardware, as well as these novel blood volume contrast methods like the magic laser. 
So now taking all these slices and stacking them together to an uh, entire brain, you can chunk it up in all these different brain areas to ultimately see which brain area is functionally connected to which other brain area. And then having the additional information, the different kind of additional dimensionality of the layers available tells us not only which areas connected to each other, but also the directionality, like who is the sender and who is the receiving end of these neural connections. And with such rich data sets of the entire human layer dependent directional connectum, new fundamental questions of neuroscience can be asked. As such, a large portion of neuroscience, as far as I can tell as an outsider, sees the brain in this so-called representational framework. The idea that the brain kind of represents what's happening in the outside world. So for example, um, sensory events are represented in the sensory cortex or visual perception is represented in the visual um, cortex. And for example, if you see a face, uh, maybe on the middle right of your visual field, the middle left of your primary visual cortex will have that represented. It's further processed to higher and higher level features along the processing stream, even to these so-called face areas, which might be a framework that's ultimately limiting us in our understanding of the brain. An alternative view to think about the brain in these channel terms that is getting more popular in some subdisciplines of neuroscience would be the so-called intentional framework. The idea that the brain isn't just a kind of passive organ that sits there and represents whatever kind of categories are happening in the outside world and then coming in as input, but rather sees it internally driven by processes like attention, expectation arousal, and so on. And since each of these different frameworks make different predictions about the layer specific activity patterns, we can chunk up the brain into areas that have layer profiles that are better described with the so-called representational framework or layer profiles in areas that are better represented with the so-called intentional framework and interactions of those two, for example, in the context of predictive coding. I was also asked to talk about the practicability of these technologies and until now, there are almost 100 ultra high field scanners installed globally. And while layer fMRI methodologies with this blood volume sensitive vaso is still a largely methods focused field, it has gained a lot of attention over the last few years and about half of these ultra high field scanners already have these sequences installed with quite encouraging results. And I'm particularly excited about these first clinical applications looking at Kind of the fine scale overlap of different finger representations in hand dystonia patients compared to healthy controls. While these ultra high field scanners are certainly helpful and advantageous for layer imaging, they will always remain a somewhat exclusive club of the top prestigious research institutes compared to the like 9,000 three Tesla scanners worldwide. And while 3 Tesla has certainly less signal, there are other things that can partly compensate for it. For example, the much slower T to star signal decay or the significantly reduced phase inconsistencies or the much faster T1 allowing us to use more aggressive flip angle schemes to still see these kind of layer patterns or these double stripe patterns in the motor cortex or these kind of movie networks with whole brain coverage, even at 3 Tesla. All the layer fMRI application papers in, in humans published to date are um, summarized and curated on this website here. So check it out, please. In fact, there are a few quite good ones, which I regret not having time to talk about now. But you can see how popular the field is getting over the years. And if I would highlight those studies that are exclusively focused on neuroscience applications without a methodological focus, I would select the red ones over here. So you can see that the field experienced some sort of tipping point, maybe two, three years ago, where it became more dominated from the neuroscience application studies as opposed to MRI tool developers. And there is a current debate going on whether or not this is a good thing and whether the tools are really understood well enough to, to be used by neuroscientists. So to conclude, Transformative brain imaging technologies bridge many different spatial scales, all the way from the macroscopic side of behavior and brain areas to the microscopic side of synapses and cells. And each of those different spatial scales have their unique 
brain imaging tools. The kind of missing part of methods to obtain a more comprehensive understanding of the brain is this mesoscopic regime of a few hundred micrometers, where we have these basic neural building blocks, the cortical layers and their connections. And this is where the value of these high resolution, non-invasive layer fMRI methods will come in. And with this, I thank all my colleagues and I thank you for your attention.